More than a quarter of the injuries reported each year by scaffolders are associated with manual handling. Fatal manual handling accidents are rare, but analysis of NASC accident statistics show that the majority are sprains and strains to the upper body, shoulders, arms, wrists, hands and fingers. Therefore, manual handling is the most significant occupational health hazard faced by the scaffolding industry today. The law says that you must decide how to avoid manual handling tasks that involve a risk of injury and where avoidance is not possible, you must make an assessment of your manual handling tasks and take steps to reduce the risk of injury. It also says that those people who carry out the manual handling must be provided with information on the weight of each load and the heaviest side of any load whose centre of gravity is not positioned centrally. This video is designed to help scaffolding operatives and their employers reduce the risk of injury and long-term health problems associated with manual handling in scaffolding. When assessing the manual handling risk, you need to consider the different characteristics that make up the activity. The areas to consider are the load, individual, task, environment, remember the acronym, light. Each of these, on its own, can have an effect, although more commonly it will be a combination of these factors that influences the risk of manual handling injury. When carrying out a manual handling assessment, it is important that the activity is taken as a whole and the interaction between these four characteristics is considered. Consultation with your workers and those who have had past experience of such work can be of considerable assistance when identifying manual handling hazards. The weight, size, shape and stability of the load all contribute to the degree of control and effort needed for the activity. The unwieldy nature in which the load needs to be handled for example, long components held vertically, such as a hoisted tube, or away from the centre of gravity when passing out scaffold boards in advance to form a working platform. An individual's age, strength, level of skill and experience will affect how much a person can safely handle it is recognised that scaffolding requires certain physical capabilities, but it is more important to utilise the specialist techniques of the trade developed over decades, known as kinetic handling techniques. The nature of the task. Find out how much reaching, bending, stooping, stretching and twisting is involved. The position of the load relative to the handler is important in determining the degree of control and effort required to do the task. If a load has to be lifted above head height, then the degree of control and effort needed will be greater than if the activity were carried out at waist height, for example, when topping out a standard on a tall hemp compared to a short one. The frequency and duration of the handling are important in determining the degree of risk. Where there are repetitive lifting operations combined with repeated bending, twisting and reaching over a period of time, the effect of all these tasks added together significantly increases the likelihood of injury, for example, chaining materials in a restricted space or working on a short lift.
the environment adds another dimension to manual handling, such as the weather, temperature, terrain or height the work is being carried out at. Scaffolders must ensure that they create a safe working platform so that manual handling at height does not increase the risk of a fall or even the risk of manual handling injury. Poor ground conditions make slips and trips more likely and constraints on posture, such as confined or restricted spaces, increase the degree of control and effort needed for the task, increasing the risk of injury, while carrying items on slopes requires greater effort than carrying on the level. Adverse weather conditions need to be considered, as carrying sheet materials in windy conditions could make the manual handling task more difficult. The nature of your work dictates that you must be mentally alert to the inherent risks of a physically strenuous job. Muscles and joints can be strained by sudden and awkward movements, twisting or jerking whilst lifting or carrying a load, or by attempting to lift too heavy a load. Poor posture, such as stooping when lifting, should be avoided. It greatly increases the chance of back injury. The stress imposed on a rounded back is much greater than if the trunk is kept upright, maintaining the natural curve of the spine, using the leg and thigh muscles to power the lift. The kinetic methods of lifting enable the worker to make full use of the body's own weight and momentum to initiate the lift. The natural shape of the spine is maintained throughout. Although the body may be bent forward, the spine should remain straight, and the lift is powered by the strong leg and thigh muscles. This method of lifting involves the minimum amount of muscular effort and thus reduces stress and fatigue. The following six key factors should be practiced until they become a single coordinated action. Feet. Any lifting or handling can only be successful if it is carried out on a firm base. You may work on the ground or from a temporary platform, but it is essential that your feet are placed so that a good balance is maintained throughout the lift. There is no correct or exact distance apart for the feet. Each individual has to consider their own weight, height and build. In general terms, the feet should be in line with the lift, comfortably apart, with one foot slightly in front of the other. The rear foot should point forward when lifting in the direction of the movement. This position gives a good, adaptable balance and a wide enough base to perform the lift. Legs. Having established a good base for the lift and realized that it may be necessary to make adjustments to balance, it naturally follows that the legs must be relaxed sufficiently to achieve flexibility. To obtain flexibility, both knees must be unlocked to allow the feet to adjust automatically. This is a requirement for all good movement. While it is important to unlock and bend the knees, they should not be placed into the complete squat position as this will place extreme pressure on the knee joints. This shows the forward leg facing the direction of the lift, while the back leg is positioned to provide the thrust for the lift. Although the lifter is only using one hand, the weight will be taken through the center line of the body, thus maximizing the use of body weight. Head. The head should be gently raised and the chin tucked in firmly. This will not only straighten the neck, but also the whole spine, and it will bring about many other corrections in body movement, automatically lifting the chest and preparing the arms for a more efficient action. This head action should be carried out at the initial stage of all lifting movements. Straight back. A bent back is a weak back. It will lead to excessive muscular tension and damage to the spine. It will also undermine shoulder and arm efficiency. Generally, if the correct head position is adopted, then the back can be kept straight, even if it is not vertical. The back should straighten automatically prior to the hands taking the load. Arms. The arms should be as close to the body as possible. The further they are extended, the greater the strain. The elbows should be kept into the body. 
Grip. When handling scaffolding, ensure that you firstly have suitable hand protection. Scaffolders spend the majority of their time handling tube, which, because of its shape, is difficult to grasp. Therefore, a good hand grip is essential. Whenever possible, one hand should be below the load, with most of the weight being taken by the palm and roots of the fingers. Before lifting any weight, you must ensure that the ground area is clear and free from tripping hazards. It is important to see that no one is in the way and that there is nothing likely to obstruct the lift. The load should be approached squarely, facing in the direction of travel. The feet must be placed apart with one foot slightly in front of the other to maintain a comfortable balance, the knees bent and the body as close to the load as possible. The tube should be grasped firmly with the arms kept as close into the body as possible, grasping the tube in front of the body. Adjust the position of the head, head up, chin in, and begin to lift using the leg and thigh muscles. As the tube is raised, transfer the grip to maintain a balanced grasp on the tube holding it close to the body. The weight of the body can be easily transferred from one foot to another, ensuring that the balance is maintained and enabling the load to be taken by the whole body. This use of the body weight is best illustrated when you are carrying long tubes in the vertical position. This shows the back leg still in the thrust position and the front foot in the direction of the lift. The back is straight and the head erect. The weight is taken on the palms of the hands and the entire body weight is positioned to resist any movement of the tube. Note that the top forefinger is extended along the tube and will act as a sensor to give early warning of any movement of the tube, enabling the feet to be repositioned to maintain a good balance. The following sequences show some of the common handling and lifting tasks required of scaffolders every day. Here, the correct foot position has been adopted. The front foot in the direction of the lift, the rear foot ready to thrust behind the load. The chin is still to be tucked in, but the back is straight. The tube is lifted. The feet have been adjusted to allow the lifter to walk to the centre of the tube, using a hand-over-hand -hand movement to maintain the weight of the load. The chin has been tucked in, thus maintaining a straight back. Having reached the centre of the tube, the hands adjust for balance. The hand, which is placed over the tube, is bearing very little weight because the hand under the tube is positioned closer to the centre of the tube and is therefore taking most of the load. Now the tube is ready to be raised to the carrying position, which in this case is on the shoulder. As the lift is carried out, it will be necessary for the body to be turned in the direction of the intended line of carry. The knees are unlocked and ready to allow the feet to adjust to the new position. The arms and shoulders are used to begin the lift. As the lift nears the correct height, the feet have begun the adjustment that will allow the body to turn under the tube and allow the shoulder to receive the weight. The load has been released by the load-bearing hand and transferred to the shoulder and the other hand is kept in position to steady the tube. The feet have nearly completed the adjustments. The shoulder hand has been placed in the steadying position and the feet have completed the adjustments, thus allowing the body to complete the turn safely. The lift is complete and the carry can begin. To place the tube back on the ground, the actions are reversed. Firstly, with long tubes, you should always be aware of overhead obstructions such as power cables. The same actions as in the previous lift are carried out until the load is taken in the centre of the hands. The end of the tube should be butted against something solid. If nothing is available, 
another worker can use the instep of their boot to block the end of the tube. Note, never use the toe of the boot because the tube could twist out on either side and cause a very painful injury. Having butted the tube, it can be raised above the head and with the body weight behind the tube and the palms and heels of the hands bearing the weight, the tube can be walked to a near upright position. The tube is now ready to be lifted. With the knees unlocked, the back straight and the chin tucked in, the body weight is in a position to resist the movement of the tube. See, the high hand forefinger is again acting as a sensor. To begin the lift, the knees bend and the hands maintain the same distance apart when sliding down the tube. This will incline the tube even more towards the lifter, who accommodates the movement by bending the high arm slightly. It is this arm that is about to take the entire load. The bottom hand is only acting as a guide and restraint. The lift is completed as the legs straighten. The legs must remain unlocked to allow the feet to make the necessary adjustments that will permit the body to change to the direction of carry. With the manoeuvre completed, the carry can begin. Note, the bottom hand is placed round the outside of the tube to act as a restraint, while the top hand bears the full weight of the tube. This method is normally used when lifting short tubes between 1.5 and 2.4 metres that are placed at ground level. The natural position is adopted for the selection of the tube. Because the initial selection is made by inserting the fingers into the ends of the tubes, it is essential to ensure the tubes are free of sharp edges and so it is advisable that suitable gloves are worn. As soon as they are clear of the ground, the free hand is placed under the tubes to assist in control. Note, three tubes have been raised, although the third one is hidden by the other two. The tubes are now upright and can be adjusted to form a pyramid pattern with the base towards the shoulder. The knees have remained unlocked and the back is still straight. The feet have made the necessary adjustments. The chin remains firmly tucked in. The body weight is still behind the load. Both the top and bottom hands slide down the tubes as the knees bend. This will allow the shoulder to be positioned just below the centre of the tubes. The weight is taken on the shoulder with the forward hand and shoulder arm acting as a restraint. Note, the rear foot is in the thrust position and the body weight is positioned behind the load. As the shoulder is below the centre point of the load, the load will easily tip over into the horizontal position with the front hand steadying the momentum. As the tubes reach the horizontal position, the legs carry out and complete the lift. With the lift completed, the carry can begin. To place the tubes back on the ground, the movements are repeated in reverse. Emphasis for manual handling in scaffolding is more often associated with heavy steel tubes. However, accidents and injuries also occur when handling boards. The weight of timber scaffold boards can vary depending on the moisture content of the boards. The natural position is adopted to pick up the end of the board, facing the direction of travel. Use the legs to lift the board to waist height, maintaining the natural line of the back. Lift the board above the preferred shoulder. Move to the centre of the board or drag the board towards you, hand over hand, until you reach the centre of gravity. Place the board on the shoulder, slightly off centre with the weight behind. The shoulder hand has been placed into the steadying position. Move the feet, change direction and avoid twisting the trunk. In readiness for lifting a long board up a scaffold, the board needs to be placed upright. Ground the end of the board. Use the arms to raise the board to the vertical. 
rest the board against the scaffold, ready to pass up the scaffold. Note that board should be placed at a slight angle and rested into a corner, for example a standard or protruding transom, so that it cannot accidentally fall. Only materials that are to be raised imminently should be placed upright. When carrying shortboards, we suggest that you only lift a maximum of three at any one time. The natural position is adopted to pick up the end of the board, facing the direction of travel. Use the legs to lift the board to waist height, maintaining the natural line of the back. Hold the boards vertically. Squat ready to receive the boards to the preferred shoulder. Then pull the boards into the shoulder at an angle. Lift the boards by using the legs. Place the boards on the shoulder slightly off-center with the weight behind. The shoulder hand has been placed into the steadying position. Move the feet, change direction and avoid twisting the trunk. When carrying a load, avoid twisting the trunk. This is a particular problem when pulling long tubes, boards from a material storage rack or vehicle bed. Take up a position anticipating the direction of travel and the preferred carrying shoulder when pulling out long items. Pull the long item using a hand over hand action until the center of gravity is reached. Raise the item level with the shoulder and turn the body by moving the feet, placing the item on the shoulder. Now facing the direction of travel, to change direction, move the feet and avoid twisting the trunk. Uprighting a long ladder is a particularly strenuous task. Place the ladder horizontally on the ground at the base of the scaffold, with the foot of the ladder in position. Prepare the landing position and ladders stays required to support the ladder. The ladder should be footed by placing a foot on each stile, ensuring the ladder is in the correct orientation, the right way up and facing the right direction. One or more scaffolders, if necessary, start raising the ladder from the other end. Once vertical, allow the ladder to rest against the ladder stay. The ladder should remain footed until properly secured. Two people may be needed to carry a long ladder depending upon its weight and length. The ladder is placed at the approximate position of the ladder base. One person foots the ladder with the soles of the feet on both styles. The other person then raises the ladder by lifting and moving towards the base. To maintain stability of the ladder, it is recommended to hold the styles allowing the hands to slide forward. Both scaffolders can then manoeuvre the ladder into position against the ladder stay. Note, depending upon the size and weight of the ladder, more operatives may be required to raise it. Extra caution is needed when picking up and carrying scaffold tubes of unequal length. Because of the unequal lengths and distribution of unequal weight, Different tubes can pivot on your shoulder, causing a scissoring effect. To carry more than one tube of unequal length safely, it is best practice to ensure that the tube ends are level and even at the front end. This is the direction of travel. When first placing the tubes on your shoulder, with the unequal length placed over your shoulder, carry out any adjustments required to get the balance correct before attempting to move off. Place the hand and arm from the shoulder you are carrying the tubes on around the tubes. This will allow you to apply a downward pressure to control the tubes. The effects of poor manual handling in the scaffolding industry can be wide-ranging and have a negative effect on your work and domestic life. Therefore, we recommend that you follow the techniques shown in this guide to help reduce the risk of injury.